Hi, it is Friday, January the 13th. I'm not superstitious. <laughs> Um, at this point, I still want to make something go wrong with this video. Anyway, no, it's Friday, January the 13th, and I continue to read and wonder my way through Paul's letter to the church in Corinth. The first letter. So today it's 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 29 to 34, just a little bit. We're working our way through this chapter quite slowly. Uh, well, in fact, um, there's only one more chapter after this, so I suspect by the end of next week, especially because I'm going so slowly through 15... But by the end of next week, we will finish up this letter and be ready to start uh, John's Gospel. Anyway, that's for later. Right now, it's 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 29 to 34. Um, to get to this point, you may recall yesterday, Paul did a nice job, I think, of asserting that God and Jesus are one, right? That's, that's like, God is not subject to Jesus, even if God has put everything under Jesus. Um, so there was that whole with and of and the same and that kind of so uh god and jesus are um are an equal playing field as it were separate but not separate um oh and then and, and there was also sort of the order of things um <clears throat> there is the resurrection of jesus first fruits and then those that belong to him and then there is the end of times um and then jesus rules it's either in the end times or at the end of times, I'm not sure, but Jesus rules uh, until all the enemies are defeated, and then Jesus basically hands everything back over to God. Um, when again, they're sort of co-equal. <laughs> they are the same, but they are not the same. Um, so that was confusing enough, didn't you think? Well, <clears throat> now we're going to move into a little passage that I find quite confusing, uh, and perhaps you'll see why. So let's just get into it. 1 Corinthians 15, 29 to 34. Otherwise, what will those people do who receive baptism on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, then why are people baptized on their behalf? And Why are we putting ourselves in danger every hour? I die every day. That is as certain, brothers and sisters, as my boasting of you, a boast that I make in Christ Jesus our Lord. If with merely human hopes I had fought with wild animals at Ephesus, what would I have gained by it? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Come to a sober and right mind and sin no more. For some people have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. There you go. Feels to me like Paul could have used an edit on this part of the letter. <laughs> I'm not quite sure what's going on. A lot of things are going on. Um, the fact that he's dying every day, um, that's interesting. Um, his quotes, let us, eat, drink, uh, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. And another quote, bad company ruins good morals. Just to be clear, neither of those quotes are in scripture. Okay, they were colloquial phrases, um, probably taken from plays uh, at the time. Um, certainly, let us eat, drink for tomorrow we die. That that been around in a lot of cultures, um, or something close to that. Um, bad company, bad company ruins good morals. As I say, Paul presents that as a quote, but doesn't give us a source. Um, I know a lot of people who work pretty hard at trying to figure out what the source is, and so oh, it could be a a Greek play. Um, yeah, it could be. Uh, the fact is, it's not scripture. It's a thing that people heard and gave some authority to it, rang true to them. So he's quoting it back to them. Anyway, let's go back to the top because... <sighs> so, resurrection is real. That's important for Paul. And here's how it's all going to happen. We've heard that already. And then he says, otherwise, what would what would those people do? Who receive baptism on behalf of the dead. If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? This is curious. Um, now, I am aware, uh, not fully aware, um, in that I can't explain it fully to you, but I am aware of, let's say, the, the, the Mormon church that do baptize people after death. You can be baptized after you have died. Um, and they have a practice for it, and they basically have a surrogate. So someone who comes in and is 
is baptized on behalf of another person. Uh, I have known people who, that was part of what they did as teenagers, actually, they got baptized for other people. Um, they didn't, didn't know who the people were. They just, they went through the full body immersion baptism on behalf of so-and-so. Um, and so people have gone up their family trees and baptized. Um, I'm not going to explain it, and I will try not to criticize it. And the fact that it's not a practice that I participate in, it's not a practice that my church participates in, it's easy for me to go like, well, listen, that isn't that goofy. Uh, and then I'm aware of all the things that I do within my denomination or my practice that people could look at and go, isn't that goofy? Um, so... And, and I couldn't tell you exactly why the Mormons do that. It might be this passage, for all I know. What will those people do who receive baptism on behalf of the dead? If the dead aren't raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? But there's no other reference from Paul to people being baptized after death. And I'm not sure in reading this that Paul is approving it. I'm not saying it's a good thing. It is happening. So Paul may be using that saying, listen, we're all doing this thing, and why are we doing it? But he does say, what will those people do? So it makes it sound to me like it's a group of people who are not with Paul, and maybe not even within the Church of Corinth, or maybe they're a part of the Church of Corinth, but they're one of the factions. Um, but somewhere along the way, that seems to be a practice. I don't know what to make of it. Um, I can imagine a debate in my head uh, with someone who does support it and I could you know, say, well, but, but you're, you're dead. Why would you need to be baptized? And the argument going, well, if you're only viewing life as a birth to death moment, then you don't really have grasped the eternity that is suggested. Uh, not suggested, it's, 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 it's very clearly, explicitly put forth by Paul. Uh, it certainly is there in Jesus, so I need to move out of that and realize, sure, you can be baptized anywhere. I do believe that we can be forgiven beyond this life. Um, so why wouldn't I? Have, why would I have a problem with that? So I, 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 I guess so. Um, yeah. <laughs> I guess for me and my denomination and the way we practice it, and we were baptized into the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus. Um, and if you've already died, I guess you're being baptized mostly then into the resurrection of Jesus. Um, I mean, for me to be baptized into the life of Jesus is, is a thing that happens here while I'm alive. Um, but maybe, maybe not. At any rate... <laughs> So let's say it's a thing they're doing. Paul is saying, well, then we're doing this thing for nothing, right? Or if it's a thing they're not doing or a group of people are doing, but they're like, they've always looked at these people like, oh my gosh. Uh, then he's saying, well, yeah, but okay, but even, even these outsiders seem to understand how important baptism is, which we agree on. And they clearly believe that life goes beyond this life. Otherwise, they wouldn't baptize beyond, beyond death. So if even those people, those outsiders get it, how can you not get that the resurrection is real? So I think Paul is using a, um, either it's because we do it, but we should understand that in doing it, we are already proclaiming the importance of the resurrection. Or, it, or, or a little more simply say, yeah, even those weirdos get it. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm not calling Mormons or people who baptize after death weirdos. Um, that was just <laughs> just Paul being colloquial <laughs> in my own little mind. Um, yeah, so Paul's looking around going, he's still, the resurrection is very important. He was saying, yeah, even they get it. Either we get it or even they get it. And then he says, and why are we putting ourselves in danger every day, every hour? I mean, if, if, if not for a resurrection, why do we put ourselves in danger? I die every day, he says. So that immediately suggests to me that what Paul is saying is that, yeah, he puts his life at risk every moment. And, and in fact, you know, you read through Acts, you read through this kind of stuff, and there were people committed to Paul's death. They wanted Paul dead. He was at risk. Uh, and he didn't shy from it. He didn't hide from it. Uh, he continued to, 
he continued his ministry even though it could cost him his life. So is that what he means when he says, I die every day? Um, so, I mean, if I didn't believe in the resurrection, if I only thought that this was all there was, that, that my death was the end of it. Well, then my goodness, I would do everything I could to extend my life, wouldn't I? I wouldn't pursue my ministry because my ministry has put me at risk. So yeah, I would, I would, I would be afraid to die. Uh, but I am so not afraid of dying. I literally embrace death every day. I die every day. Paul could be saying that it's kind of, it is, and it is a, a boast. Um, that is as certain brothers and sisters as my boasting of you boast that I make in Christ Jesus our Lord. Oh, what a clever tongue Paul has. Um, yes, you may think that I'm boasting that I die every day, but oh, that, oh, that's, that's, that's only one of my boasts. <clears throat> the other that's just as important is that I boast of you. Again, let's recall Paul is the founder of the church in Corinth. So he is basically saying, I am so proud of you. Now, he's been admonishing them and will continue to do that. But he also now says, and I'm very proud of you. So I boast about you all the time. Ooh, ooh you boast about us, Paul? Oh, gosh, we should listen a little harder. Um, <laughs> I think Paul is just really laying it on thick here. <laughs> Firstly, that's what I think Paul is doing. I mean, he is he's boasting. Oh, you know, I die every day. Um you want to say, well, no, Paul, you, you, you don't die every day, right? I mean, you know, some days nobody knows where you are. It's okay. Uh, some days they're not coming to get you. You're staying in a safe place. You're 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 fine. You've got a thousand adoring people around you. You're probably okay. Nope, I die every day, he says. Um, and if you doubt that, just want you to know that that is a boast. But that's a boast that I make. I make in Christ. I mean, I, I make that boast because I believe... I believe it's, it's, it's Jesus that keeps me alive. It's not it's not me. It's 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 Jesus that keeps me. And by the way, I also boast about you guys because you guys are the greatest. Okay, that just feels a little mm, to me. But when I hear those words out of context, because I'm pretty sure this is not what Paul is saying, but it's what I hear. I die every day. I don't know how your faith works for you. But I need to renew my faith every day. Every day there is a moment or sometimes a very long period of time when I am dying to the old. Um, even though I have engaged my faith professionally for over 30 years, even though I have uh, lived my faith, I, I like to believe that, for longer than that, I still regularly die to the old. Because it's so easy to fall into the old. The old anger, the old vengeance, the old, um, oh, sarcastic tongue. I have a good sarcastic tongue. <clears throat> the old desire for... Uh, for attention and affirmation, um, all of those things. And I have to check myself, and I have to do it every day. So when I hear Paul say that, I'm reminded that faith is not a thing that I pursue and accomplish and never have to do again. It's not like a degree at school, right? It's not like buying a car. I have it. I can drive it around now. No, I have to live it every day. So actually, it's like buying a vintage car that you have to work on every day to make sure the engine keeps working. Uh, not a brand new car where you just drive and don't think about it. Um, okay, I'm really stretching. <laughs> Simile there. Um, but <clears throat> for me, that's the wonder I take out of that piece is how every day I, am, I, I need to die a little bit to the old. It's more like John's baptism, just sort of just letting the old go and coming alive again. I believe that I am in the spirit, so it's not a rebaptism, but I die and I come alive every day. Uh, and I do that in my faith. So in fact, I could use those words. I just don't think that Paul is using, is means it in the context that I'm using it, but I'd say those very words. I die every day. It's just a boast that I make in Christ Jesus, our Lord. I'm not afraid to let go of the old because, because in my faith I've discovered something that's better. 
as tempting though as it is you know and it does it draws me back and i get sucked back into it it's like oh wait a minute remember your faith oh no you're right this is better this is better yeah i am dying to an old way coming alive to a better way that's a boast because the better way is is what i've discovered in in, in jesus so i could use the very words paul uses uh just the context is entirely different and then paul goes on <clears throat> If with merely human hopes I fought with wild animals at Ephesus, what would I have gained by it if the dead are not raised? Let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. There is no record that I have ever read of Paul fighting animals at Ephesus. Um, but indeed, maybe he did. Uh, and just, I mean, you know, we would look at Acts, would probably, or he'd reference it in another letter, and it's not. So we have no record of that happen, but perhaps indeed he did. He may have been in the wild and attacked by wild beasts um, uh, or had to fight them off. Or maybe he was, you know, kind of like the Christians and the lions thing. Uh, yeah, maybe he was persecuted, um, uh, arrested, and one of his, um, uh, his sentence was, 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 was to battle wild uh, animals while people watched. I, I don't know. Um, but what he's saying is, like, I have been through some serious crap. And why would I do any of that if I believed we eat and drink and die? Why? Better off just to simply eat and drink uh, and then enjoy my death, as it were. Uh, make sure that I have a happy death, surrounded by more food and more drink, uh, if that's all life is. And he does. He quotes what would have been a well-known phrase. Um, what did I grow up with? Uh, eat, drink, and, and be merry, for tomorrow we may die. Uh, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Um, as I say, I, I know, I mean, that, that is a, 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 a Roman phrase. There's a Greek phrase. There's an Egyptian phrase. It, there was just that sense of like, uh, it's, um, oh gosh, I can think of it in, uh, in Norse stories as well. We are alive now. Enjoy it because we are not guaranteed a tomorrow. Eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Um, either said going into battle or just said to recognize, yep, there's no guarantee of tomorrow. Paul is saying that I might as well live that way. Right? Why, why am I wasting my time dying every day, putting myself at risk when I could be protecting myself? You know, why am I fighting wild animals in Ephesus? Uh, why now? Why would I do any of that unless I actually believe there was more to this life? There has to be more, Paul says. Otherwise, everything I've done is stupid. Uh, which is kind of what he said yesterday in a sentence, but now he's drawing it out a little further. So Paul, in typical Paul fashion, likes to make the point again. And so I think he's basically done that. But what I find interesting is that he has um, used a colloquial term or, or used an, a, a quote from outside of Scripture. Um a secular quote, uh, a pagan quote. Uh, anyway, whatever it is, it's it's not Jesus and it's and it's not the law. It's not Moses. Um, it's, it's not uh, it's not Hebrew scripture. It's not Jesus. Uh, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. And that's argument enough, he says. And I and I do appreciate that because not all of my spiritual insight has to come from the Bible. I can read a book, I can listen to something you say, I can live my life and suddenly the word of God breaks through in that moment. Might be a movie. Um, who knows what it is. Um, huh. I don't know if you remember the movie Cocoon. My gosh, Ron Howard directed it. What's that, 40 years ago? Gotta be, more than that. Um, anyway, this uh, alien comes to Earth, and, and, the, and these old people basically figure out how to live forever, um, thanks to this alien, and they're going to go off and live forever, um, except for one. Uh, but even as like as a, as, a, as a teenager, I remember looking, watching them, going like, "But why would I want to live forever? I don't think that's a good thing. I think that that I that that, that I'm living and I and I move on and and, and I want to see what comes next. And I'm never going to see what comes next if I just stay alive forever. I remember thinking that it was kind of sad that these people were so glad that they were going to live forever. Um, and I would tell you that as a teenager, um, I heard the voice of God in that. Um, so 
I do hear God in 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 the secular world, in the pagan experience. Oh gosh, I hear it all around, not just in Scripture. So I kind of like that Paul has used a quote that is not Scripture, and he has used it to make his point about resurrection and faith. And then he's going to want to use another quote. So he says, "Do not be do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals." We don't know where that quote comes from. Uh, Come to a sober and right mind and sin no more, for some people have no knowledge of God. And I say this to your shame. He's leaning in hard on that one. So as I hear those words, I wonder, okay, so he's basically, to me, it sounds to me that he is saying (sighs) that if you don't believe in the resurrection, then you don't believe in God because they are intertwined. The resurrection is evidence of God's relationship with us and our relationship with God. Um, Because resurrection is intimately tied into Jesus and we can't know God without knowing Jesus as far as Paul is concerned. So you see all these things fit in. So if you don't believe in the resurrection, you don't believe in Jesus, don't believe in Jesus, you can't believe in God. You have no knowledge of God. That's what he's basically saying. But with a sober and right mind, you'd get this. Now, let's remember, he was called to the church in Corinth, alerted to them by a, by a letter. Um, things are not going well in, uh, in Corinth. And we've tried to guess what the issues are. So we figured out there's factions that are arguing with each other, but they're also very much uh, under the, the sway of, 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 of popular support. They like the fact that, that people in Corinth think, wow, these followers of Jesus, the, the, this, this church in Corinth, they are, they are pretty cool. They're mysterious and really neat. Uh, so they're they're dining out a little too much on that as far as, as far as Paul's concerned. So he's leaned in on that. So okay, guys, straighten up. Think about what you're doing. This has become a ridiculous event. Uh, these church events, we need to focus again. This is all through the letter. So that's what he's calling for is this sober and right mind because the way you're living would suggest that you don't really believe in any of, of, of what's important and therefore you don't really believe in God. That's why he says, I say this to your shame. Look at what you're doing. And why are you doing it? Well, I think that's where the first quote comes from. Bad company ruins good morals. You have the best of intentions, but you're hanging out with the wrong kind of people. <laughs> oh, growing up, I heard a lot of parents say about that, about their kids. Oh, Tommy would be such a good boy if he didn't hang out with those bad people. Their bad influence on him. No, Tommy was a jerk. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I... I digress. Um, uh, if your name's Tommy, I wasn't talking about you. But again, it's that kind of Paul flattery saying, yeah, you you folks are are misguided, but not your, it's not your fault. It's just you're keeping bad company. And their bad company is ruining your good morals. You mean to be good. You mean to believe in God. You mean to be faithful. But these other people are making that impossible. So... Get rid of them. Now, I also think really what he's saying is fix your practices. But he's doing it in such a way that they don't feel under the t- attack quite the same way. It's like, oh, no, Paul thinks I am good. I just have to stop hanging out with Tommy and doing the Tommy things. Okay. Instead of saying, Norm, stop doing those dumb things. I put them on Tommy. But the fact is, the Corinthians were doing them. The Corinthians were having some kind of gathering that they would kind of, they'd call a Eucharist, but it wasn't. It was a big banquety party. And Paul's ashamed of that and said, no, if you're hungry, eat at home and then come to the Eucharist. Um, They were having all sorts of people speaking in tongues all over the place. It was a cacophony with nobody explaining what it meant. And they just all felt really good that it was happening, although nobody could understand it. So it wasn't doing anything to share the word of God. Paul says, stop all that. But rather than saying it's your fault, he's saying no, it, it, it's some bad influences. So move them out and become more focused. And so that does invite me to consider the company that I keep. Uh, and sure, sure, uh, you know, if you are looking to get sober, you stay out of bars. You know, you can, well, you could go to a bar and not drink. Yeah, I know. But it's a lot easier if you just stay out of bars. If you're looking to quit gambling, you stay away from casinos. 
you know, you can go to a casino. It's true, you can just go see a show. Um, but it's going to be tempting, isn't it? So stay away from that. So if you're trying to clean things up in the church and refocus, then maybe stop having those parties or stop inviting those people to be part of it. Right? Um, so I... I see that and I can look at my goals for myself, dying every day to the old. Um, and yet how much do I tie myself to the old by the company that I keep? So I think there is something there. But I would not jump so far that, I'm, that I think that Paul's telling me that I need to you know, quit talking to my old friends. When I read this, I also have to think about, yeah, but this is Paul very diplomatically calling these people out. But when all is said and done, they have chosen to be the community that they are. Right? Nobody forced them to have a banquet instead of a Eucharist. They chose to do that. And I may like to put things off on other people and say, well, I wouldn't have done that except for, and then he made me mad, so I had to. Bad company ruins good morals. Yeah, maybe. Maybe that's true, but I need to take responsibility as well. And I think that Paul, well, I'd say in a subsequent letter, but he doesn't do it in 2 Corinthians. <laughs> but I think there's a point uh, at which you can say to people, and, and now grow up and take responsibility for yourself. So I think Paul's soft-soaping a little bit here. I say this to your shame, he says, so he's happy to shame them, but not give them the responsibility because it's bad company, it ruins good morals. I don't think it's just a matter of getting the bad actors out. I think it's a matter of everybody in the community refocusing. But maybe I'm reading more of that into it, more into it than I need to. Maybe it's my life that I'm reflecting on and not the church in Corinth. I don't know. Anyway, I've just wandered my way all the way through that, and gosh, I've gone on a long time yet again, so I'm going to stop right now and offer a prayer. So let us pray. Loving God, Thank you for this time of wondering. Thank you for this, this time in which we are invited to, to die to the old and come alive. Come alive not just to the new, but come alive to your presence, to come alive to your word. God, we ask that in the wondering today we hear your word and that we are not only encouraged, but strengthened that we might follow that we might grow in faith. We pray in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, through the Holy Spirit. Amen. And that's enough of me for the day, but I look forward to checking in with you, oh, on Monday. Have a great weekend. Next week, I think we'll finish up the letters. That should be how it works, but uh, we'll see how it goes. But anyway, whatever you do, please have a great weekend and know that you are blessed. Know that God loves you exactly as you are. Um, who you are matters to God. Uh, and, and know that God's love moves through you, whether you know it or not. And it matters. God loves the world for you. Don't ever forget that. God bless you. We'll see you Monday.